Yo, what up? This your boy David Lucas, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. We listen to y'all. We take your questions. We take your concerns. And we always try to do what's best for the viewers. Me and my producer, Brian. We always try to do what's best for y'all. We try to listen to y'all because y'all are the ones who watch this. And without y'all, I'll just be putting videos out with no viewers. Uh, so you guys asked for a long-form podcast. Uh, you said you love the clips, but you would also love a long-form podcast. So I'm introducing you to my long-form podcast Fake news with David Lucas. This is my first episode, episode number one. Bow, 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 bow. What's that, Dad? I'll be talking about what's going on in my life, stuff that happens on the road, uh, kill Tony stuff, you know, interactions with diff different people that I come across, and, uh, you know, topical stuff that's going on in the news, you know, whatever's trending at that time. And we'll also have Dear David at the end of the podcast. Um, so make sure you send uh, any, if you need life advice, dating advice, or any type of advice in general, just make sure you send your questions to bookdavidlucas at gmail.com. We do have some of those today that I will be reading. Excuse me, drinking that Diet Coke. God dang. Um, make sure you go to my website, davidlucascomedy.com. I will be in Baltimore. How do you say it? Baltimore. Baltimore. We want to go to the store, get some to you. I'll be in Baltimore next week at Magooby, September the 14th. Your boy will be there September the 18th. That Sunday, I'll be at Sandman in Richmond, Virginia. Never been to Richmond before. I can't wait to go. I've been to Magoobies. I uh, worked there with Shane Gillis, Brendan Schaub, and I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. So, yeah, I'll be there. Help me sell that thing out. It's a, it's a mini arena. If there's not at least 200 of y'all, it won't be a good show. So I need at least 200 people to pull up, pull up on me. I was in Vegas this weekend at Wise Guys. Great shows, but the trip there and back was uh, hectic. Um, so it was cheaper to fly to L.A. Uh, because flying directly to Vegas for Labor Day weekend, which I didn't even realize was Labor Day weekend because I'm not a Jehovah Witness, but I don't really care about holidays unless it's Turkey Day or Crimmel, like black folks say, it's Crimmel. Uh, so I didn't even know that it was Labor Day, and I was trying to book a ticket there. Well, the club, you know, they give you the travel buyout, and to fly to Vegas was astronomically high. So I was like, hey, why don't I just fly to L.A., and uh, me and my feature, Ryan Joseph, he's been on Kill Tony a couple of times, would just drive from L.A. to Vegas, which is like three and a half hours. So Ryan lives in Austin. So he uh, went to L.A., got a Turo. He got the worst Turo that, you know, I, he told me he got a car, and I'm like, all right, he knows it's 113 degrees in the desert. I'm like, he got a good car. So he come and pick me up in my apartment in L.A., and he's in like a 2011 Chevy Malibu. And I'm like, damn. All right, whatever. So uh, the air condition won't get cold. It, it like it will not get cold at all. It's like probably a crisp seventy nine degrees in the car. And I'm like, bro, like we are about to drive through the desert. This car is gonna be hot as hell. We start driving. One hour into the trip, the air condition goes out completely. So we had to stop at this little truck stop, tire fixing place where they're able to charge you astronomical prices because. You're in the middle of nowhere, and they're like, what are you going to do? You're here. I'm like, bro, we got to pay whatever it is to get this damn air conditioner fixed because I'm a 300-pound man driving through the desert, and I ain't going to make it. It's just not going to happen. Like, I do the sauna, but not for three and a half hours. Like, this was insane. So we get the air conditioner fixed. It takes about 45 minutes for them to charge the air conditioner and do whatever else they had to do to it. And we drive to Vegas. No problem. He drops me off his hotel. He goes to his room, check in. He comes to pick me up for the show. We're driving to the vape shop when all of a sudden the, start, the car starts sputtering. It's like, and we can't drive over 25 miles an hour. And I'm like, bro, what the hell? And he's like, yeah, I did. I'm just going to park my car right here. I'm like, well, I need to go to the vape shop first because I got to be on stage in like an hour. And you got a feature. So what are you talking about? We're, we're going to drive 25 miles per hour. All the way to the club is five minutes away. You're not parking. Park the car here and take an Uber where? Like, no, we're going to drive 25 miles an hour to the club. It, maybe we messed the car up even more. I don't know. I 
I want the people I don't really care. It's not my car. You know what I'm saying? It's Toro, bro. Even if this, even if this damn car was on fire, drive it. I got to get to the club, and I'm not taking an Uber. And by the way, cars driving 25 miles per hour, air condition is pristine. It is cold in this car. There are icicles falling off the ceiling. It's very cold, but it would drive 25 miles per hour. We get to the club. Lucky enough, there's a car shop next to the club. So I'm like, bro, this is perfect. You, you leave the car right here. We call him in the morning, and we get the car fixed. Like, how the car is driving. Like, I'm that type of person. Like, it's driving, so that must mean that it's not going to be that expensive. We have a great show. Great show. We had a heckler at the show. His name was Eddie, a drug-dealing barber from Atlanta. I have the interaction on video. We're working on getting captions on it because... The soundboard media, the soundboard uh, media corrupted, and we weren't able to get the soundboard sound. So the sound sounds like trash. And you really need captions to know what the hell I'm saying and what the hell he he's saying. So Eddie heckles for like 40 minutes. Back, we're back and forth for 38 to 40 minutes. Nobody throws him out. I'm like, whatever. I'm I'm one of those comedians. I can handle it. You know, like I I can handle hecklers. I can roast with you. I'm good at improv. Let's go, Eddie. We'll do this. I had fun. Some audience members had fun. But some people were also very upset because they were like, I came to hear you, not Eddie. So I apologize to you people. The next time it happens, after 10 minutes, I'll cut it off or ask for them to be removed. We have a great show. Great show. Great, great, great show. My boy Marcus Smith hosted. Uh, my dog Gator out there in Vegas. And then another dude did a guest spot. I can't remember his name. Uh Funny dude, he opens for uh, Eddie Griffin. So Saturday morning comes, uh, and mind you, all right. So <laughs> to tell you how names are tricky, I almost forgot this part. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was staying at, I think it's called the Thunderbird or something like it was some. Let me see if I can find what hotel I was at because. The confirmation made it sound so appealing. You know what I'm saying? I got to find this hotel. I was at the Thunderbird Boutique Hotel in Vegas. Anytime I hear the word boutique when hotel is involved, I assume that it's about to be nice. Like, they lied so much on this hotel. Like, uh, when when the club sent me the money to book my hotel, I should have known it was a sham. I... I do not pay attention. I am a very aloof person. They sent me the buyouts for travel and hotel, and I booked something close to the club. Thunderbird. I normally stay on the other part of the strip. If you're familiar with Vegas, down there by the Aria, you know, past the Venetian and all that, by the Vidara, Caesar's Palace. I normally stay down there, but the club is in the Arts District, down there by the Stratosphere. So I booked the Thunderbird Boutique Hotel, and... These hotels know how to take pictures to to sell you on a damn hotel. This the hotel I was in there for like thirty minutes initially when I had to change clothes, get ready for the show. I didn't realize how shitty it is. It is a very shitty hotel, and the reason I found out it was shitty is because I lost my key and I had to go get my key at like one a.m. in the morning, and there was a damn pimp. And his straggling looking hoe checking into the hotel at 1 a.m. in the morning. And I'm like, where the hell am I? They were both dirty. She looked unkept. I don't know who paying for her sex, but well, I guess that's why they're saying that the Thunderbird was expensive. That that hotel was like 180 a night. But I guess because it's Labor Day, that's why they could charge 180 a night. This will tell you how raggedy my hotel was. I was right next to a Motel 6, and Motel 6 actually looked more appealing this day. We had a pool. Um, you know, like, I got a nice room. They like, pool view. The pool was like an 8x8. Eight 8x8 by eight. Eight by eight pool, and it was full of fat hoes. All of the women in there looked like Respucia from Norbit. It was like, they were so big, they made that pool look like a kiddie pool. If any one of them would have did a cannonball, there would have been no more water in that pool. That's 
That's how big they was, bro. Like it was. So I got a pool view. So I open my bedroom window, the curtains, to see big butterball turkey women swimming in whatever is in that pool. I wasn't getting in the pool. They probably didn't put chlorine. They probably just boil the water and put it in that pool. They probably didn't put chlorine in that pool. So the hotel is trash. If you go look at the Thunderbird Boutique Hotel, they have pictures of cocktails. They have pictures of like a brunch. And uh, <laughs> they make it look so nice. They Next time I will spend money out of my pocket not to stay at the Thunderbird Boutique Hotel. Do not stay at the Thunderbird Boutique Hotel if you want to have a pleasure, uh, uh, a pleasurable experience in Vegas. Go to the Venetian, the Vidara, the Aria, see anywhere. This was I've slept on air mattresses that felt better than this mattress. And then I had like a gray prison blanket. I should have videoed this damn room, but I was only there for two days. I'm like, all right, this ain't that bad. <sighs> Whatever. Because I was thinking like this is a... I want those. I, I, I'm real bougie about hotels. It's because I spend like um, you know, a good amount of money on my mattress for my bedroom. So I want a nice bed when I go out to make me feel like I'm at home. I like I love sleeping at home. I'm very comfortable. I can play my music, but you never know what you have when you go to these hotels. And comedians, we live out of hotels Thursday through Saturday. That's just the bottom line. I'm not rich enough to where, or I'm not famous enough, or I'll be there soon, to where I'm getting five-star hotels every time I go somewhere. It, it just ain't happened yet. Hotels trash, we know that. So here comes Saturday morning. It's like 9, 10 a.m. Ryan checks in with the mechanic, and the mechanic's like, oh, your car will be ready at 1, and we think it'll be between four to $500. I'm like, all right, cool. That's that's not bad. It's a It's a Toro. We talked to the owner. The owner was like, I'll take care of it, reimburse, whatever. Cool. Me and Ryan go eat at some buffet in a Fremont casino. And mind you, Ryan stayed up all night losing money, winning and losing money at the slots. I don't really gamble. I'm not a big gambler. I don't like chance like that. Uh, So he stayed up all night winning and losing money. So we went to go eat, we went to go check on the car, and when we get back to check on the car, they crank it up, and this car is shaking worse than it did the first time. And we're like, what the hell? And he's like, let us check it out, we'll call you in an hour. They call us in an hour, they say it's $1,800. The mechanic talked to me, you might as well be speaking Japanese, because I don't know, all I know is catalytic converter, muffler, headers spark plugs, serpentine belt, stuff like that. When they go to talking all that other language like combustion and compression and you're not getting power, I, you, you've you lost me at this point. So I'm like, $1,800? I said, bro, you're going to have to call the Turo guy. So the Turo guy was like, well, well, is it driving? And we're like, yeah, it's driving. He was like, we'll drive it back to L.A. And we're like, bro, it goes 25 miles an hour. L.A. is 200 miles away. That would take us 10 hours to drive to L.A. How stupid are you, bro? Do you think we're on horseback? Like Horses gallop faster than that. I'm, we're not driving a car 25 miles per hour back to L.A. It's not happening. So finally, I'm just like, all right, bro. I, I'm going to just figure out another way home. Period, point blank. So I ended up flying back to L.A. because I had to because my flight left from L.A. Monday morning. To come back to Austin. So I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm flying back. You should do the same. He's like, oh, dude, I, I'm waiting for a package. I'm like, bro, I'm out of here. After the show Saturday night, I'm going to go home, sleep for five hours, and take my ass to the airport. I got to see my children on Sunday because I already promised them. You know what I'm saying? Being on the road and my kids live in L.A. and I live in Texas, I got to spend all the time with them that I have free. So I went and spent time with my kids Sunday. Flew back. To Austin on Monday, did Kill Tony. It's going to be a dope Kill Tony episode. Uh, we have, who's on there? Ron White, Brian Simpson, and I believe his name is Ryan Long, uh, a Canadian comedian that now lives in New York. He's very red pill, and he enjoys my stuff on YouTube. So that's always a plus. 
That was my weekend. Crazy. Great shows. Great shows. Uh, Vegas, I do apologize to y'all for not bringing any merch. I am getting restocked up on merch so that I can take care of you guys. I promise. And I will offer all my merch merch at my next uh, Vegas show for a discounted rate because a lot of people ask about t-shirts and I just didn't have them. I am apologize. I'm so sorry to y'all. So, that was my weekend. How y'all doing? I can't wait for y'all to see this new Kill Tony episode. It's, it's you're you're really going. There were, in my opinion, there were no good bucket pulls. The regulars did their thing, but I, y'all watch it, and then what? In two weeks, you give me your fair, whatever you think. All right, so we're going to trending topics. Uh, Kanye. I love when he's, I don't know if he's on his meds, off of his meds, having a manic or bipolar episode, but I love it. He uh, tweeted, we learned a lot about Kim this week. Uh, So we'll get into the John Legend, but uh, can we pull up that tweet that Kanye said about Kim? (laughs) They made him remove all that stuff off of Instagram. He does it. He'll put up 80 posts in a day and then delete them. Like, nah, bro, leave it up. We want to see this. Pull up that tweet about we found out that Kim has diarrhea. Ladies, is 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 that how bad you want a BBL? We get diarrhea because some of that booty juice don't slipped into your intestines and now your bowels ain't gonna never be right. Is that the price of a BBL? It's big, voluptuous, but now your insides is liquid. So here's that Kanye tweet. Y'all can see it on the screen. He tweeted, Kim has diarrhea a lot, like way more than a normal person should have it. I'd rather you cheat on me than tell the world that I have a dripping faucet for an asshole. I'd rather be cheated on. There's just something about diarrhea and taking shits where it's like, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this. Uh, John Legend. Uh, light skin. Light skin, bro. Light skin men, they be acting like women, bro. Him him and his wife, they some criminals anyway, bro. They, they horrible anyway. Light skin men, bro. I'm so glad I'm brown and I don't have this yellow man complex that John Legend has. So John Legend explains falling out with Kanye. It's not just politics alone. John Legend says his friendship with Kanye West dissolved because of who JL supported in the 2020 election. Not so much who Ye supported of late, namely Donald Trump. The singer did an interview with the New Yorker this weekend and they covered a range of topics. But the most interesting perhaps was when they talked Kanye and why he and John aren't cool anymore. Something many just chalked up to differing politics. That's not exactly what ruined things, though, according to John, who explains that he doesn't just burn bridges because of who someone votes for, but but more so the why. He says, I don't feel like politics should be everything in your relationship, and your relationship with people should not, shouldn't only be determined by who they voted for, which is true. Like, if if you don't support me because I voted for Donald Trump, that sounds like a, a you issue. If you are mad at me because I want Trump 2024, That's a personal problem. Do you enjoy paying astronomical prices for gas and chicken wings and everything else? I don't. Bro, go try to buy a new car right now. I I was trying to get a new car a couple of weeks ago. Man, I went to a dealership. That fool told me $80,000 for a Jeep. I said, I'll Uber before I give you $80,000 for a Wrangler, bro. If I'm going to be in an $80,000 vehicle, it's going to be Mercedes Benz or better. Who is paying 80? I feel like, and I could be wrong, man. I feel like they're trying to pull, a, pull the okie doke on a tatted black man. They're like, oh, yeah, he coming to spend money, man. You, you know, he, 
All right, so John continues, I don't want to live a life that's so consumed by politics that it's the sole determinant of who can be my friend and who can't. But values matter and character matters and moral compass matters. Well, well, John Legend, how do you sleep next to that wife of yours every night if you're so judgmental of your male friends when you sleep next to Catwoman, dude, or whatever? Christine Tiggin, whatever. What's that? While J.L. was speaking somewhat broadly here, this answer immediately followed one he gave about Kane specifically. So you got to figure this applies to his old buddy too. But on why he and Ye aren't cool anymore, explicitly John says it's more about the fact he didn't get behind Kanye West's presidential campaign, but instead co-signed Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, apparently. Kanye took great offense to that, seeing it as a personal betrayal. John says it's up to Kanye if he wants to bury the hatchet. One last thing, he says Ye's habit of posting private texts is a non-starter. See, another yellow guy quality. And he's also disappointed that the guy was apparently being used as a pawn in 2020, reportedly by bad actors with ulterior motives. Here's my thing. If my dog is running for president, my homie, I'm going to tell him I'm going to vote for him. Bro, how he going to know if you did or did not vote for him? Your one vote. If if right now, Tony Hinchcliffe or Hans Kim or William or somebody else I know, Shane Gillis, anybody... Any of my friends said, I'm running for president. Bro, you got my vote. I could be lying. You think he going to follow up with... Do you think they're going to follow up with that? Did you vote for me? Just say, yeah. Who They, they don't know who you put in the, on the ballot. Just say, yeah, and vote for whoever the hell you want to vote for. Unless you're getting paid to endorse a certain uh, presidential candidate, man, just, just vote for your homie, dog. That's... Lie. We all lie to our friends, man. We all lie. We all lie to our friends, bro. We all lie. So, yeah, more Kanye news. Uh, Kanye is a fool. I'm going to support Kanye to the end of the road. That's my dog, unless he just does some weirdo stuff. And I can't support him no more. But for now, the crazy rants, I like it. A lot of people see it as red flags, and I don't. Like, bro, it's social media, man. Get over it. So what? I hurt your feelings. So Kanye said that uh, him, Tristan Thompson, Travis Scott, and Scott Disick are, <laughs> they're all sperm donors. Uh, he he shared a screenshot of the three men who are all fathers to several of the Cargena babies and kids. He captioned the scathing post, calling my fellow cum donors. We end this together. Uh, the men named are the exes or current partners of Courtney Kardashian, Khloe Kardashian, and Kylie Jenner. Courtney and Scott share three kids together: Mason, Penelope, and Rain. Khloe and Trisha now have two kids together. Uh, True, and the other kid's name is unknown. He was born on August the fifth. The youngest mom of the Kardashian crew is Kylie, who shares two kids with rappers Travis Scott, Stormy, and a son formerly named Wolf Webster. But his new name has yet to be confirmed. These people are crazy. Uh, so Kanye's Instagram rant began early that afternoon when Ye shared another screenshot regarding where he wants his kids to go to school. The post read, my kids going to Donda. They're not going to Sierra Canyon. Charlemagne, the God, and Chris, get your popcorn along with the caption, hi, Hillary, hi, Mark, you're going to take me off Instagram? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I, I like this stuff. From his rant, it seemed that there have been uh, disagreements with him and his ex-wife about where their children should attend school. The 24-time Grammy winner also shared a screenshot of a text message that he sent where he wrote, y'all don't have so-so over my black children and where they go to school. They will not do Playboy and sex tapes. Tell your Clinton friends to come get me. I'm here. Both Kylie, along with her boyfriend Travis and Kim, have posed post for Playboy magazine and Kim rose to fame in 2007 after the sex tape with Ray J. We know that. That same day Kanye wrote about not wanting his daughters to follow in their mother's footsteps when it comes to posing in Playboy. I get it. But also you gotta watch who you have kids with. Yeah, That's all I'll say. Like I, I get it. You want better for your kids and I don't think they will have to when their daddy's a millionaire unless they just hate you. 
Um, when he wrote the anti Playboy comment, Ye wrote, Don't let Chris Jenner make you do Playboy like she made Kyle and Kim do. Then added, Hollywood is a giant brothel. Is he lying? Is Kanye lying about Hollywood being a giant brothel? No. Pornography destroyed my family. I deal with the addiction. In the odd post, he then concluded, Instagram promotes it. Not going to let it happen to Northy in Chicago. Kim Kardashian and the rest of the family have yet to respond to the post. They're not. Because if they respond, they know Kanye's only going to go harder. He's going to go harder. Uh, you know, he got the little controversy with uh, Adidas as well. And a lot of people are backing him. Uh, Diddy and Swiss Beats, they say, we got your back, yeah. Uh, they're ripping Adidas as culture vultures. Uh, Kanye West allies are lining up for his increasingly heated showdown with Adidas. And he now has a couple of hip-hop heavyweights willing to stand with him. I love this so much. But See, people think Kanye crazy, but people in the industry really know with him, about him. And they really mess with him. Both Swiss Beats and Diddy backed up Kanye's recent attacks against the shoe company with individual Instagram posts of their own. Swiss, who's currently entangled in a legal culture war with Trillers over Versus, admitted he was buttoning in the conversation but still urged Adidas to treat Ye like a Spike Lee joint and do the right thing. The post was supported by industry execs such as Boo Tim, uh, I guess that's how you say it, and Dre London, and eventually Diddy, who texts Ye, bowing to never wear anything made by Adidas until everything was smoothed over. Diddy cited Run DMC for pioneering the brand into hip-hop fashion, but threatened to burn it all down if Ye and the culture were furthermore disrespected. Y'all can say what y'all want about Kanye and him being crazy and him ranting and not being on his meds, but there's a few things you can't say about that man, that he is not a great father because Northwest is his twin, and you can't say that he don't get shit done. Kanye West gets shit done. Period. Uh, the Bad Boy CEO has emerged as a guardian of sorts in 2020, taking the exact same stance with Swiss and Timbaland in their fight against Triller. Ye has been accusing the fledging sports apparel of stealing his designs only to sell them in lesser quality and expensive versions and demanding meetings with various heads of the company. I I can see the, the likeness. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. That ugh, Adidas was not making shoes like that. I'm a big sneakerhead. Uh, over the past few days, he's been going extremely hard on Instagram chained his profile pics to the faces of different board members and pulled the Paul McCartney card on Adidas director Alice Dar Willis, shaming him for not taking a meeting when the song Four or Five Seconds is a family heirloom. Wow. Dang, that's... That's, that's deep. Um, you know, you want to get stuff done. Use your platform. Use that. That's 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 all I'm gonna say. You want to get stuff done, like yay, use a platform and get her done. Just point blank, period. Get her done. So we have more news. Uh, so y'all y'all know how I feel about Black Lives Matter Incorporated. So Black Lives Matter leader accused of stealing ten million. Dollars from the organization. Uh, the leader of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation has been accused by former co colleagues of stealing more than $10 million in donations from the organizations for personal use, according to a lawsuit filed in court this week. Shallow Maya Bowers was called in the court filing as a rogue administrator, a middleman turned usurper who siphoned contributions to the nonprofit activist group to use as a personal piggy bank. Hmm. Really? Yeah. I would have never known. According to the lawsuits filed in Los Angeles County Superior Court on Thursdays, Bowers' actions led the foundation into investigations by the Internal Revenue Service and various state attorney generals, blazing a path of irreparable, irreparable, what did you say? Irreparable 
harm to BLM in less than 18 months to suit claims, while BLM leaders and movement workers were on the street risking their lives. Huh? Risking their lives? Risking their lives burning down shit? It's, you mean risking their lives to not get hurt in the stuff they were causing? Like, what? what risking their... <laughs> yeah. Risking their lives. Yeah. Mr. Bowers remained in his cushy offices devising a scheme of fraud and misrepresentation to break the implied, in fact, contract between donors and BLM. The suit filed by Black Lives Matter Grassroots was light on details of the alleged theft of funds, but delved into the fissures within the network of Black Lives Matter groups, charting change from falling victim to the, why do I use all these words, carceral logic and social violence that fuels the legal system and taking legal action against them. I want to see his house. Do you got a $3 million house? They were ready to take the same steps of our white oppressed. Oh my God, here we go. See, this is the lingo that makes me stray away when they start. If you're not 180 years old, you have, or 80, you have not been oppressed. They were ready to take the same steps of our white oppressors and utilize the criminal legal system, which is propped up by white supremacy. Oh my God. This white supremacy stuff, man. How if if there's so much white if there's so much white supremacy, how were you able to swindle ten million? White people gave you that money. Black people do not donate to Black Lives Matter. I say this all the time. Black people do not donate to Black Lives Matters. That is an LGBTQ funded organization. The same system they say they want to dismantle to solve movement disputes, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation's board of directors said in a joint statement. Bowers is one of three members of the board. Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation is an administrative organization that raises funds to distribute to Black Lives Matter grassroots, the umbrella organization for local chapters of the group. Bowers was hired by Black Lives Matter co-founder, uh-oh, we hear his name again, Patrice Colors. In 2020, to help raise and distribute money to groups within the foundation. <laughs> distribute money into your bank account. Attorney Walter Mosley, representing the plaintiffs in the case, alleges that Bowers instead engaged in self-dealing, giving grants to his own consultant firm and charging exorbitant fees, reaching eight figures. The lawsuits demand that they return the people's funds and stop impersonating Black Lives Matter. <laughs> they, they are impersonating Black Lives Matter. The lawsuit was announced at a news conference Thursday hosted by Black Lives Matter, Los Angeles co-founder Melina Abdullah, who said that Bowers shut her and other leaders out of the BLM social media accounts in March by, by changing the passwords. Ah, I see exactly what they're doing here. So what Miss Colors and Miss Abdullah are going to do is use Bowers as the scapegoat. I've solved this thing already. They're going to say, "No, we didn't we didn't misrepresent the fu the funds. We didn't we didn't do anything wrong. We hired Mr. Bowers to to you know be in charge of the distribution of funds and when he distributed the funds we thought that you know it was justified even though you know 5 million dollars was deposited into my bank account I thought it was justified I thought he paid taxes on it I thought everybody else had been paid equally and I was going to use it to buy a house so I just thought that it would be cool Sure. I already see where it's going. They're going to use him as the scapegoat. Um, 
Oh, no, where is it at? No, 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 no. As Abdullah leveled accusations at Bowers, he shot back in a statement claiming that she was the one who committed financial malfeasance. How do you say that? Malfeasance. He also accused Abdullah of unprincipled decision making and a leadership style rooted in retribution and intimidation. Black Lives Matter has come under fiscal scrutiny since 2020 when the group received 90 million in donations amid protests following the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis police. Exactly. The organization filed its first public IRS tax form, <laughs> tax form 990 in 2022 and was criticized by some for buying a $6 million studio city comp. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. They're, they're criminals. They're going to use this, from what I see, they're going to use this poor guy. I could be wrong or I could be right. It's just me thinking outside the box a little bit here. They're going to use this poor guy as a scapegoat. <laughs> That's what I see. It's so weird. Is is this this whole BLM stuff, bro? Is it's it's crazy to me. And going right from BLM to somebody else who needs they ass beat. Uh, if, on Twitter, uh, there was this this very weird lady. Uh, Martina Big, uh, she was born white, but now says that she is black. Is race something that people can decide to change? Let's pull up that video. Are we are we able to hear the audio, Brian? This lady is out of her mind. Like she don't even look good, black. She looks dirty, like she was in an oil spill. You know how them uh, ducks be looking? Here she go. So, yeah, let's watch this video. Like I said, she looks horrible pretending to be a black woman. She only look like a... It, it looks like a white person in blackface. Like, <laughs> I am getting a headache with humans. I am so ready for aliens to come. Let's listen to what she's talking about. That's the reason why I'm going to be in January. I want to go to Africa to learn more about the cultures. I hope when you go to Africa, they they beat your ass. I, I hope you get attacked by bees when you go over there with this stupid ass hair and this stupid brown shoe polish. To avoid misunderstand. Look at... <laughs> he a white dude and he's sick of the shit. <laughs> That's how you know when I'm... Bro, you got this white man with his head. <laughs> he is sick of it. He's like, what in the... What the hell is wrong with this? <laughs> He's sick of it. He trying to hear that she talking about. But you... And but you don't know about the cultures and the person itself. But you understand that, that, that race and color is much more than skin deep. Uh, it's heritage and yeah, pedigree and tradition and history and, 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 and struggle. It's all of that. How does he get it? How does he get it? He just told her it's more than just skin. It's heritage. We don't get to choose our skin color. Just be proud of whatever you are. Those things that you can't hope to get anywhere near with three tanning injections. No, but but also the the um, all these steps, also having uh, black curly hairs and uh, going to change also my nose to really. Uh... His face is like she needs to be locked, and the other girl not even impressed. She for for those of y'all just listening, I, I wish I watched the video because the faces that they have is is insane. <laughs> African version, also more wider here, You're and so further and also have we'll off. We'll off. yeah, and also have butt implants. He looked like he's seen a damn ghost. 
he looking like he <laughs> looking at a three legged man. Like also, I like the curves of black women, and I want to um, get them step by step. Man, <sighs> mental illness is not to be taken lightly. That is all I can say. So yeah, to wrap up uh, trending news that has happened so far uh, from the Shade Room. Uh, a lot of people may or may not follow the Shade Room. Uh, Chris Rock was over there in uh, London. I think Jeff Ross is with him. Uh, Dave Chappelle. And I saw, who was it? Michael. Michael. What's the black dude's name from SNL? Can't think of his name. But uh, I saw all of them over there in the picture. Uh, so Chris Rock slams Will Smith's hostage. He called it a hostage apology video during his London stand-up show. Dave Chappelle responds to his own attack. <laughs> According to Deadline, while performing performing at London's O2 Arena Saturday evening, both Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle addressed the attacks that they both experienced on stage earlier this year. During his set, Chris Rock took some time to speak on the Will Smith situation, during which he said, F your hostage video, which was in response to the apology video Will posted to his YouTube and Instagram back in July, which took way too long. As previously reported, the video was the first on-screen, on-camera appearance Will had since the incident. In the video, he issued a verbal apology to Chris and said, I reached out to Chris, and the message that came back is that he's not ready to talk, and when he is, he will. Yeah, the the video was just not heartfelt. Uh it it was basically like how all of us felt. It was Jada making him do that, but I don't know. Could or could not have been. Maybe, maybe it was. All right, so to wrap up the show, uh we're going to do our Dear David segment. Uh, and it's basically where you, my viewers, sending your questions. If you need life advice, relationship advice, I'm going to answer them. Anything you need help with, make sure you send your questions to bookdavidlucas at gmail.com. All right, so we got our first, we got our first Dear David. This is from Rob. I don't know where you live and I don't know how old you are. Yo, what's good, bro? My question is, what were some of your side hustles in the past that made you consistent money? Or do you have any advice on how to make some passive income without owning property or selling j- drugs? Laugh my ass off. Peace. You the goat. Um, you got to find a job. You got to have a job to finance your dreams, bro. That is point blank period. I've had probably 20 miscellaneous jobs in L.A. Uh, and now it's a little bit easier because you got stuff like Uber, Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash, where you can kind of work your own schedule and still get to your auditions and your shows. Uh, back when I first started in L.A., uh, 2010, bro, you had to work a job because we didn't have all these services where you could use your car to make extra income and stuff, you know. So uh, now this is actually a great time to be an entertainer or a comedian, bro, because you can be lifting or doing uber and go to an audition and lead the audition and go straight back to uber and make good money make six hundred six seven hundred dollars a week if you work it like a job you, you know you put wear and tear on your car but you know that's the price to kind of have your own freedom all right we have another dear david this is from melanie a.k.a. Mills. She's 33 and she lives in Glendale, Arizona. I want advice about how to handle myself for a professional. I the hell I want advice about how to handle myself professionally when I know my coworkers are going to try and break me and try to dominate my work ethic. I try and break me and try to dominate what do you mean when you say dominate my work ethic is that a good thing or a bad thing don't let nobody dominate your work ethic whatever and don't let nobody break you just 
realize that a job is a job and go work for the six or four or eight hours or however long you got to be there. And I mean, the, the less someone knows about you, the better off you would be. People can only really, uh, have issues with you when they know a lot about you. So don't be friendly. Go to your job and be an asshole, and nobody will bother you. I think that's my advice. Be an asshole at work, and you won't have any issues. We have another Dear David. This is from Jesse Lewis. He's Jesse Lewis is 21 from Sarasota, Florida. What's up, Big Papa? Hope to see you in Tampa this December. Yeah, pull up, bro. I'm in, I'm in Tampa at what is it, Side Splitters. My question is, what got you into comedy originally? Was it always a passion of yours, or did you see someone in particular who inspired you? You're one of my favorite comics right now, and I appreciate your input on day-to-day events. Thank you. Um, No, I I always knew that I would be in some sort of entertainment realm where people would see me and admire me. At first, I wanted to be an NFL player. I acted early on in life. Uh, I kind of got into comedy by accident when I was in high school. Uh, I got on the Yo Mama show. Uh, the writer, I ended up being a writer on the show. The head writer uh, recognized my comedic ability and my comedic time, and he said I should do stand-up. And long story short, he sort of kind of taught me about joke writing, and I started doing stand-up from that day forward. Still did some acting stuff, but fell deeply in love with stand-up because you can say what the hell you want, and you write your own script. Like In, in essence, you're an actor that writes your own script. Let's see. We got another one. From the hood, I don't know joke writing. Only snapping. I can go off with the best of them, but to write a structured joke, nope. Any advice, bruh? Maybe I should give up on trying to dream and stay in my lane as a mall man. Oh, mailman. P.S. I don't want to start out blowing beef, but flowers to you, G. You're so quick, funny, accurate, and great humility. I pray MFers like you become as big as you want to be in comedy. Love and respect, big homie. Uh, we're all essentially from the hood, bro. We this This country was founded by some white hood people. <laughs> in essence um don't let that be a handicap just you being from the hood joke i mean there's a lot of great comics that grew up less fortunate in life from the hood or whatever i mean most comics did not have it good growing up so don't let that hinder you um if you really Want to be a great comedian? Start writing as much as possible. Uh, you know, structure a joke. There's some great comedy books out there. I don't know names now, but you can look up books. You can look up books uh, on Amazon about joke writing, structuring a joke, set up punchline, set up, set up punchline. Uh, tell a story. Just make sure that it's funny. You got to find those punches. Um Yeah, that's what you got to do, man. Don't let being from the hood hinder you at all. A lot of great comics are from the hood, the ghetto, grew up and grew up with nothing in life. So you can't let that hinder you at all, big dog. Just if you really want to do it, I believe in my heart that you will truly find a way to do it. Just like you found that job to be a mailman. That's a career job. So if you really want to be a comic very bad, you'll figure it out, dog. Get them books, watch comedians, watch a lot of old comedians back when it was basic joke writing. You know, now comedy is so much more intricate and people got all these different styles and different ways they land and deliver jokes. So just keep watching and pay attention and read up on it. All right. So uh, this is Hunter from Gloucester. I work at AutoZone, and my manager, who is a U.S. Army in the U.S. Army Reserve, just got called up for a one-year tour in Syria that he didn't sign up for. He leaves in a month. All due respect to my store manager and all our troops were both active and reserve, but if the U.S. Army is calling retail store managers to war, should we be worried? 
Also, David, you look like if Jimmy Dean Sausage or Balenciaga. Thanks for reading this, Hunter. Ah, wow, that's funny. Um, should we be worried? I don't know, bro. I, how I live life, I try not to worry about stuff that I can't control. What I can control, I stress over that. And the uncontrollables, I don't stress. Like, I'm not stressing over if the earth is round or flat. I'm not stressing over if we're going to get destroyed by a comet or a tsunami or earthquake. Because guess what? I can't control that. I don't think we're in any... I, maybe the U.S. just want to have a threatening presence over in Syria. Who knows? Maybe he's just doing patrol or some minor security that they don't want to send elitists to, so they call these people from the reserve because they know, or maybe he signed up for it and didn't tell y'all because the money was looking so good. Is that an option? I mean, you said he's like, what, 32? Or you didn't put his age. But, I mean, he could still be in good shape. I, as long as he's not... 55. Like, once they started sending people in their 40s and 50s, I don't know, Rogan's 50-something, and he looks amazing. I believe he can still go overseas and kick some ass. But as long as they're not sending, you know, everyday civilians that are like 45 and older, I think we're in pretty good shape. All right, so we have uh, Barry Montoya from San Fernando Valley, 22 years old. What's up, David? My name is Barry Montoya. I'm 22 and I live in the San Fernando Valley. I found you through Kill Tony. You're an absolute beast on stage. Much love and respect to your craft. What were some of your favorite, if any, and horrible moments during open mics when you were first starting out? I've had some pretty dog shit moments, getting heckled by other comics and looking like a noob, going home defeated. But I've also had a few moments where the crowd is cool, the jokes hit, and everything's cool. Do you also think it varies on location? For example, do I do mics in L.A. and Hollywood in the Valley? But I prefer the people in the Valley because they're more cool and less picky on what they think is funny. I feel a lot of L.A. comics want to appeal to the woke, hip crowd. Stay real and keep killing. Um, what type of comic do you want to be? Do you, do you want to be an alt comic? Do you want to be a far left comic? Do you want to be a comic that tells the truth and you don't give a damn about other people's opinion on you? Go to these mics and get this stage time and utilize it and write, write, write. Uh, make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do and don't worry about the crowd, bro. I sucked my first three, four years. It, it was okay, but I sucked. We all suck in the beginning. Don't worry about being funny. Don't worry about uh, validation from other comics especially, bro, because they are not going to tell you that you're funny. Just point blank, period. You will. Never find validation from other comics. Not an open mic scene anyway. Uh, but just keep being you. That's all you got to do. And I think you'll be fine. Stay on it. Stay on it. Be performing five to six days a week. Write your ass off. Always try new material. And you'll find your voice in like six to seven years. As long as you're staying consistent on stage. You know what I'm saying? It's about your confidence and your delivery. Remember that. Nobody can steal your persona. All right, bro. I hope that I hope that answers your question. Uh, comedy is a little bit different in LA now, bro. Y'all got a lot of pay mics. Uh, after the quarantine, you know, LA got real woke. The Valley is different, you know. Every everywhere outside of Hollywood is very different. But I, even when I do shows in Hollywood, I do the same set that I would do anywhere else. If the crowd don't mess with it, they just don't mess with it. I can't stress about that. Seriously. But, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question, big dog. Uh, is that the last one, Brian? Hey, so uh, that was the end of Dear David. That's the end of the podcast. Make sure y'all checking out davidlucascomedy.com. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment. If y'all mess with the long-form podcast, let me know. I'm all about putting out what's best for y'all. Uh, y'all continue to be good. Stay out of the way. Say what you want to say. Live your truth, big dog. That's all you got to do, man. Especially in this woke-ass time we live in. Live your truth. And don't just do something because you're following the crowd. Be you. Be you, you goofy-ass people. <laughs> all right, man. Y'all be good. Peace. Thank you for tuning in to Fake News. Fake News.